I got interested in visual arts at about uh, the age of 10 years old. I mean, uh, all, all children at some point have, a, have an interest to, to, to draw. But I realized that my interest was a bit further also uh, because I was caring about what colors I'm using and also um, discovering the, the potential w within the, the, the different sorts of, of, of colors. So this started at that time and also at some point the way how the curriculum of education was back then in Albania is that you had to uh, by the age of 13 you had to to know because at 14 you had to choose whether to go to the normal gymnasium normal high school or the or the arts or the art school and then from there onwards there was no return you could not change your mind afterwards um, but because I, I got a, a really keen interest in, in in painting visual arts already at that age I think since then it became very uh, it gave me time to, 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 to find out about how real my interest was for that. Um, of course, it's also a, a moment when we think of that, uh, of that time, um, that there was not uh, really a freedom to, to express yourself. Now, of course, being a child, you are more or less forgiven towards certain things, but but uh, by, by the time of 13, 14 years old, once you'd enter in the school, there was no more uh, a margin of the, the margin of error of what you could do outside the accepted form was getting thinner and thinner. Uh, yet it had an interest because on one side, one did not um, want to, 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 to get totally dried by that very orthodox approach to to how things should look or how they should be painted or represented. On the other side, the best way to save yourself from that was also to, to, to remain very attentive and uh, about how things look. Like, therefore, be extremely curious, have uh, sort of sharpen your, your attention to what you see and how you represent it in a realistic way, of course, because being realistic about it was also a very good defense that you are not straying out of what was accepted, but you are not doing it formally, like according to the forms of social realism, but you are just doing it because this is what you are seeing. And I think this, this sort of uh, uh, protection that comes from heightened visual alertness it's something that maybe has helped me and like i guess also other people from from that time uh, even after even after one's things once one was free to 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 express uh what one thought or sees or feels in in ways which are either figurative or completely abstract uh, and also because over time uh there are no such such uh strict frames as about what what and how you can represent something still this is what the french call l'air du temps there is always the the what is fashionable at a given moment uh, uh, in this case it's not some political superstructure that obliges you but it's the, the the taste of the time and how the society evolves and how the market say evolves etc and in that sense this has been a very good school uh, and and uh, uh, for me to to always remain very alert about how I see things, despite of what used to be back then, what was allowed, or what is uh, nowadays what is welcome, meaning what the society likes, what uh, the how the the discourses evolve, and what sort of shapes they they like. Coming from Albania, uh, and Albania was a very close country, so you totally recognize yourself as being the artist from the country, the only country you knew, which was Albania, as we could not travel before the 
country opened and even once the country opened the, the rest of the world was not open to us to let us go in at, at which i think an artist is not where it comes from it's a combination between where you come from and where you are going to with the difference that you know where you're coming from but you don't know where you're going to but the less you know where you're going to the more important that question is so in that sense uh i yes i definitely uh, the where i come from albania but also there is a shared culture there is despite the political or disagreements there is a, a shared sense of humor in the balkans there is a, a shared sense of of uh, how ripe reality can be or surreal uh, and i think this is something that pertains this is something that uh, uh, remains with you but then one has to also be um, careful or it's something I, I i realized very early on is that when you come from what you call the suburbs which the Balkans are to, to, to Europe or the world, the whole world is to the, say, Anglo-Saxon civilization. Uh, in the beginning, you are very welcome because you come what, with what people think is this exotic thing, like you are bringing news from, from uh, elsewhere and uh, all content that, that gives manifests what the elsewhere is, is very welcome. But as an artist, I was always very jealous about my own freedom that it's not just about bringing news or about content it's about the form you give to that uh, content so it's 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 not about where i come from but it's about what i make of it In my practice as, a, as an artist, I mean, there have been few uh, turning points. Some of them were came from outside and some came from inside. And of course, there is a combination between between both of them. Uh, the first turning point, um, once I decided to study art, was the fall of the communist regime, the, the, the rupture that it brought, the... the, 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 um, the the way it changed um, lo the laws by which the society was abiding, the ve abiding the, the values of the society, uh, the common imagination, the individual freedoms, etc. So that was uh, one uh, big moment. Another one was when I moved uh, to continue my studies in Paris because it produced it. It did make the the, the frame around me much wider. Uh, which also, it had already been preceded by an interest in moving image because this is how I did the diploma for uh, the, the project of the diploma in the Academy of Fine Arts. Um, however, once I arrived in Paris, I really continued my, my studies in, on video and therefore the, 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 there's this big change going from, um, from painting and fresco, which was something that I was really keen uh, on while I was still studying in Albania, into, into uh, video. And then within the, this new medium that allows for a total other way of, of developing your own thought and your approach, there are uh, other sub-chapters which within the, my work as in itself are more important one could feel them more in the work which was in the very beginning one of my earlier works uh, is intervista uh, which evolves a lot about uh, language language albania in this case it's um, it's a film where i interview my mother having found a real 60 millimeter film where the sound is voiced uh, is lost but where one can see her uh, present in the congress of the of the um, of the Congressi Rinis, the equivalent would be like the Congress of the Communist Youth, although that was not exactly the wording of the of the thing. And and also uh, shortly after that, 
uh, within the same reel of film, uh, it's an interview that she's giving to, uh, to the journalist. But the sound was lost and then the finding of the sound, there's this almost like this archaeological uh, uh, approach, became the trajectory of what was to become the film Intervista, where not only um, I was able to find the content without finding the sound, but also by finding the, the, the words that, that were that were said, that were pronounced in this interview, um, I also realized that it's not only about the content in language, it's also a lot about the syntax. The, 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 it sounded unarticulated. So, uh, and this started to make me think a lot about language as something which is not as transparent as it seems, um, but it's, it can be rather very opaque. Uh, and, but you can only see its opacity the moment that something breaks and something did break with the Albanian language, like having to move so right on from um, from the uh, communist regime, where as a tool it served the propaganda, it served the way how the regime educated or controlled people. And then all of a sudden through the period of transition, like from one year to another, from one day to, to another. And of course, the syntax could not flawlessly uh, adapt to the to the change um, so it both made me very interested in language but also made me very aware of, of its opacity and just to finish it more like like a like a metaphor in that case syntax is like the glass of a window when everything is fine you see the view but when something breaks you see the glass no no cuckoo no cuckoo Bunyur kuku Bunyur kuku Bunyur Bunyur kuku Bunyur kuku Bunyur kuku Bunyur kuku But then you realize also that language is is uh, is a tool of power, uh, not only in Albania, not only in a dictatorship, not in a certain kind of a dictatorship, but it can also be so in democracies, like how accent plays a role, how the way you speak, and uh, be it English in England or or English in, in US or, or the way you speak French. And it, it tells a lot about where you're coming. It tells a lot about where you are within the, the structure of power, etc. But the first reaction I had to that, it was that um, a, a, a sense of distrust, so I, which made me more interested in taking sound altogether out of the films, which followed with a couple of short films, like Womo Duomo, when there is no sound, and then the sound came back, but no longer as, as language, but as sound. And then another chapter is when sound uh, articulated itself towards music. Uh, and which around 2003, 2004 starts this chapter uh, in my work, so to say, time-based work where the music is, uh, is essential, uh, not only essential as content again, but it's what allows for structuring the work. Um, structuring the, the content, structuring how time passes by, because music has a, a very specific way to, to, to structure uh, time. And then, of course, uh, later on, when I was able to do more and more exhibitions, uh, the, 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 the making of an exhibition became, to me, a, a format which is very important, because uh, it's not, I, from the beginning, and increasingly so, I never saw the exhibition as an opportunity to show my single works, but as a as a as a way where uh, you you stage you put together in the space different works and and uh, uh, a dialogue starts in the spaces in between and how to articulate this the the in between spaces in the exhibition which are also the spaces that the that the visitors that the viewers are are inhabiting um, and and music plays in my in the case of my work uh, uh, a very helpful role in that. Well, 
uh, in the beginning it was properly speaking a relation to time like um, it probably the first time I was very aware of, of, of time and the time it takes was when I was working with Fresco because uh, so that was when I was still in Tirana studying it's uh, you have to paint the fresco you have to cut it separate in what you call giornata for, that comes from Italian so this is the surface that you are able to paint non-stop during the day uh, while you constantly keep it wet and then the moment you, you, it dries there is no way you can add more to it and then the whole uh, magic of it is how giornata after giornata day after day you 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 bring in the puzzle to produce the, the, the fresco. So you are very much aware of time, the time it takes to the pigment, the time it takes to the, to, the, to the liquid to dry, the time it takes you to express yourself and to reach the final saturation of the image within a day. And then uh, it totally changed when I started working with video because there it's about time being recorded. So it's not like time as experience, of mine as an artist, but is time as an experience of the viewer. And me as an artist, uh, like it was the case with Intervista, then you become aware of time as a way to, stru to, to structure narrative between things that happen before, now and later, like it often happens in, in films, whether fiction or documentary. And Intervista, precisely so, there is there is a found footage, so there is a then moment and there is a present moment when the film is being shot, but also it's the future we are talking. I'm talking with my mother and we are concerned about. Um, but then there is the moment that music came in, then there is no more past, present and, 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 and future, clearly separated like language does because it has different tenses. In the music you are within what I like calling the present moment. Of course there is a memory of what you heard before, and music also plays with it, certain compositions with the idea of the ritornello, etc. But still, you are continuously in the flow of time. Yeah, I think, I mean, first Bruno Pizzul, it was um, probably, it's no longer known to, to the younger people in Italy nowadays, but uh, when I grew up in, in Albania, one could see sometimes up to a certain point, I believe, things which were not necessarily political, like a, like a sport. So, or they would retransmit re uh, uh, an international football match by taking it from Rai or the, uh, and therefore uh, the, 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 the sound of, I, to some extent, I grew a little bit with the sound of Bruno Pizzo. In the same way, there's a whole, probably you or a, a previous generation grew with that sound. And, and of course, then, then there is this uh, crossing in time between his sound, which is like, it, it, it brings in so many memories of the past, uh, a memory of a sound which comes from somewhere we didn't know or we couldn't know. But it's also telling you for for about things that you see, which was like a football match. So I was very interested in 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 uh, both of reporting something from the past in the future, in order to keep its potential. I like playing with the idea of uh, of this possibility that Ar that Argentina did not just or a country from somewhere out there did not just only win once against England, but it could constantly do so as long as one reported the facts in the future. Ma ecco, d'improvviso arriverà Diego Armando Maradona che con una mano salirà più in alto delle braccia tese di Shilton, toccherà il pallone e lo metterà in gol. Succederà tutto proprio così. Il piccolo Maradona con la mano a beffare il gigantesco Shilton. Yeah, absolutely. In the case of uh, Le Clash, which 
combines both uh, a music box and the and the barrel organ when I worked on it, but also what I believe comes out of the film is in this combination of these two musical instruments, which not only predate punk music, but they are like centuries before it. And they are also, you, you just can't associate one to the other because punk is so much about energy and, and it's so little about melody, while music box and barrel organ are so much about the, 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 the melody. They have a, a way that is, they are like, their architecture, their organism is such that they, that it's not the way they bring in melody automatically makes it sound like something from the past because of the characteristics of, of, of their sound. So I was interested in, in blurring or mixing up or uh, bringing trouble to this relation between what comes first and what comes after. Because having done the film in the, you know, 2000, I don't know, 11, 12, around then, the, uh, it's one film after the other. Of course, when you think of punk and the beautiful or very interesting period both musically and politically you think of it as something from the past the recent past but still the past but the moment that you listen to the song should i say or should i go of the clash through music instruments that are even from much earlier centuries earlier then troubles this uh, the, the 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 idea of chronology of time <laughs> It's also true to say that, especially in both cases, because it's about turning and the turning gives the, the, the pace, gives the rhythm, uh, especially in Tlatelolco Clash that I shot in Mexico, uh, also the place that I choose, it's, it's a place which is very rich in, in its meaning, historical meaning, because it's the, the square of Tlatelolco, where not only it was the, the last place where the, the Aztecs lost against the, the, the Spanish, uh, against Cortes, it was also the place where the students were killed. Um, just before the World Cup by the military and the police. There's also the place of the infamous earthquake that followed. So a lot of the buildings that you see around, some of them exist and many of them are no longer there. Then another aspect which is interesting is uh, that I, I cut the score for barrel organ of Should I Say Should I Go into many parts and I distribute it to the people and I, I gave them a, an idea of when to come and play it and the barrel organ became a little bit like a, a voting station where you bring your voice because uh, and the voice is like a vote like like in French it's like when you say a voice it's also the vote when you are putting the vote inside. And of course, every person was bringing their own piece of music, depending on their age, depending on how they felt like, depending on their, on their dynamics or their attitude, play it faster or slower. So this embeds into the whole uh, continuity of a song, uh, so many individualities, which I was uh, interested in. So at the same time, it breaks a lot the song, but also it it it, it gives it a very uh, unique continuity. Well, I think the, the, I'm very interested in, the, in the, how the body remembers, how the, the body takes in and repercutes events uh, and the choreographies that come from it. Um, even more so in, 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 a, in periods uh, or in a period where discourse has become so important uh, that a way to resist what could have been a tyranny of the discourses is also how the body resists, how it chooses to remember otherwise. And this can be how the body uh, remembers or an individual uh, 
surviving the siege in Sarajevo, how it remembers what to do or not to do, how to duck down when you have to go through this very dangerous crossings along the, the, the sniper, what the famously called back then nicknamed uh, Sniper Alley. Um, this is also how the body remembers to, 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 feel, to, to play a musical instrument. Um, and then, actually, um, like in the example for Averavel, which is a, a piano concerto written for the left hand, it's written for the left hand because the right hand is missing. And it's all these compositions with, that were written mostly during and just after the, the, the First World War, because this is the war that saw the most of the mutilations, for many reasons that I won't have the time to, to, to list them uh, here uh, and now. But on another level is how the body plays with the uh, left hand what and how it remembers the right hand playing because the left hand will have to make up for the missing hand so i think there are there are so many uh, ways that even escape us that there is always a delay between understanding being able to analyze and, and objectifying the way how we remember things and how we want to talk about it and, uh, and uh, intuitively have the feeling that sometimes the body is a step ahead. Well, the, the difference uh, between the last resort, uh, which also uh, employs musical instruments like, such as uh, uh, drums, but the difference is that it's not a human being playing them, uh, but it's the, they're like custom-made drums, meaning that they, they play by themselves. Um, and in the case of the last resort, they are all suspended, like a suspended uh, orchestra, which each of them being suspended upside down. Now, uh, again, it's very musical piece. It's based and, um, on, on Mozart's clarinet concerto that uh, he composed around 1791 or 92, which also is maybe like a year before the Marseillaise was composed. Uh, so it's, and so yes, there is a historical time, uh, not only because it corresponds to what is the golden age of enlightenment which meant that in the in the western civilization it's about uh, certain notions that did not necessarily exist before or were not as spread before among the average men and women um, which is a certain sense of uh, acknowledgement of the other a certain a separation between the secular and the religious the fact that the artist is is considered like the, the idea of the genius or the idea of the artist being this individual. The fact that the, the human as the individual takes an importance and is uh, uh, outside of the religious and outside of the of the of the hierarchy of the aristocracy. And the, so this is a very important moment. But at the same time, it's because of this. Uh, uh, newly found self-esteem in the individual and in all these progressive thoughts. Uh, it also corresponds, it, uh, such clarity produces blindness because the moment that such high ideals of, of, of enlightenment reach to other shores or, or other ways of life, I think we also know clearly today how they, they brought the, the ravage, how they ravaged other ways of uh, other cultures, uh, other ways of life. Uh, the first time I showed Last Resort, I was also commissioned, or it was commissioned to be shown in, in Sydney. And of course, we know the history of uh, um, the colonization of Australia is also about the time, about the time that Mozart was writing the, the concerto. This is also about the time when the first fleet was arriving in, in Botany Bay. Uh, and uh, subsequent, uh, we know the, 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 the rest, what it meant for the Aboriginal people. So I was very interested about, okay, what does it happen to a piece of music if one puts it in a bottle and throws it in the, in the ocean and follows the winds and the currents of the water and will it arrive intact on the other side or what would happen to it? In the same way that 
that uh, the, the ideals of enlightenment did not necessarily arrive uh, intact, intact in other shores. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's why I mentioned 1395 days uh, without red before, because it's about it's um, it's a it's a fiction in a way, because uh, but it's still based on a, on a reality. Uh, it's it's uh, based on what it meant during those four years of the siege for people to carry on with their life, what it meant to, to go somewhere, and once you made it, it still meant that you had to come to go to go back. The, the way how survival and the, and the urban grid of the city, they came together. How a city which is thought in a grid beautifully developed among, uh, in the valley between the hills and along the river, how all of a sudden its, its grid becomes a weapon, its urban grid becomes a weapon against itself because it produces like this visibility from the, from, from the hills, the way how it makes vulnerable the, the, the citizens of the city, but also the strength that they, 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 they found, the strength that goes often unseen. It was like how to reflect the impact of a geopolitical situation, of a heightened risk on music. The idea went through the breath, how the, the main actress, Marie Belle Verdoux, how she would be going to a rehearsal. Also, this was based on, on, a, on, a, on a, a real story of the of the Sarajevo Philharmonic Orchestra that continued to rehearse every day and they made, I forgot now the precise number, but they made hundreds of concerts during the siege for the people, which was also a heroic way of, of not giving uh, in, not surrendering, uh, in, a, in the most civilized way possible. Um, and, and so what it meant that running, catching your breath after every crossing, how it impacted your breathing and how breathing Im impacts the way you are you are whistling or you are humming a piece of music and if this piece of music is Tchaikovsky's pathetic, what does it do to that piece of music which has a certain order in the way in its, in its tempo? Even only if, which is also explains the idea of the algorithm, uh, is this biconditionality of it, of two things that are dependent on each other. So the fact they are dependent on each other, it means that none of them comes uh, uh, first. So time and, and space, they are completely bound into it. And in a less abstract way, it's my aim was how the elegy, which normally in normal recordings is between five and a half and six minutes, depending on the interpretation of the musician, how to make it last as long as it takes a garden snail to go from one from the beginning to the very end of the, of the viola bow. Based on, on tests and also knowing the average speed of, of a snail, I knew that it would take around eight minutes. Then you don't, you can't anticipate everything, but that would be more or less it. So there was an understanding from the very beginning that, that the music would need to be stretched. And then with Gérard Cosset, the, the, the famous uh, viola player, uh, uh, we, we discussed possible ways of where and how the music would be stretched. But then there is this tactility. It's a tactile composition because the snail, by its progress, inputs the way how the musician is going to, to play the music. The, the, the musician, Gérard, he has to to take into account the position of the snail, at some point two snails in the film, to make sure that through his choreography he is turning the bow in such a way that it does not hit the shell of the snail when it goes, when it goes over the strings. So all this is like a continuous negotiation and this sort of uh, heightened alertness which is part of a continuous negotiation. It's something which I, I think it's very present in my work, whether it's with Long Sorrow, with the saxophone player was suspended, uh, whether with uh, even only if, and in a different in a certain way also with 1395 days uh, without although it was written b before but it was again how the the grid of the city impacts the uh, impacts the, the breath for example and how the breath impacts the duration of a piece of music in this case it would be how the progress of the of the, of the snail uh, 
impacts the, the execution of the music by the, by the uh, viola player. Uh, so in, uh, it's interesting in this conversation because we just went from 1395 phase to if and only if, but in a way it's both, in a certain way, are like road movies. Uh, uh, um, road movies which are made of encounters. At this moment, I'm working on a, on a film which is part of a of a uh, of a project for um, in in Houston, which have been postponed. Like many things, were postponed for all of us, uh, but which also allows me more time to prepare it for reasons related to production. I am doing it in CGI, like computer generated images, because it's been very difficult and and extremely expensive to do it for real. It's about a, a turntable, gramophone, we call it in Albania, uh, a turntable which is playing a piece of music, but it's doing so while it's gravitating, it's spinning in zero gravity inside the uh, International Sp uh, Space uh, Station. And therefore, because of the, 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 the spinning uh, and the, the, this peculiar gravitating of, uh, in weightlessness, it does so that the, that the arm and, and the stylus uh, sometimes makes contact with the vinyl and sometimes loses con contact with it until it makes contact again and this impacts the piece of music that it's uh, it's playing um, and it's based on a, on a piece of Olivier Messiaen uh, called Quartet for the End of Times and uh, the movement within this piece uh, which is called the Abyss of the Birds which is for a clarinet solo but in the it was rearranged both for the reason of uh, producing a new continuity or a new chronology, depending on making contact and losing contact between the stylus and the and the vinyl, but also uh, it's no longer uh, uh, a solo, in the end of the world, but it's a duet between a, a clarinet and a saxophone. Um, so it also produces a, a, a sort of an an empathy because where there is two people, there is empathy. So where there is two voices, two instruments, it produces a, a special kind of empathy within the music.